Hello and welcome to our latest virtual bridge session and today I'm joined by Marcelo Crolla from the University of Edinburgh. We've already talked about the paths paved with gold. Um, <laughs> and it's about your latest online course, which is ironically enough about creating online courses. Oh, look at that. What what a mix. And and I, I was just talking to the room and I was just saying how how much I've seen um, just online. Pe people talk about online design, instructional design, creating those online spaces. But sometimes when you take those courses, you do wonder if <laughs> people had read their own tips around instructional design. So, so that's why, that's what we started talking about. I said, like, so tell me, did you walk the talk, Marcelo? Tell us no, more. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, th well, thanks very much for having me along. Um, what I'm going to quickly do is quickly share my screen, make sure I am sharing the right screen. Um, right, so, um, yeah, so just looking at this, so we're talking about how we created an online, how to create an online course at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we're just going to give you a sort of, uh, going to give you a quick outline of what we will cover um, this morning. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about our sort of overviews and motivation for the course. So why, you know, why we did this um, how we came to this idea and the things that we were hoping to, to share with everybody when we were developing this course. And we'll obviously talk a little bit about the key topics. Uh, hopefully at the end of the presentation, we will give you an opportunity to have a little sneak peek of the course and just show you some of the things that we have covered. And we will also explain a little bit about how we did this. So we'll talk a bit about the sort of principles behind why we built this course. We'll talk you through how we did it. And we'll also talk a little bit about, you know, why this can be applied to any courses out there. And that will be covered at the sort of the end section uh, of the presentation. So just starting off with the sort of overviews and motivation for this. So one of the things we, we looked at was trying to discover the, the sort of key skills and um, how to create online learning experience. Now, this is quite a difficult question to answer in general um, because everybody has their own their own take on that. But what we tried to do is, so how can we package that? Um, we wanted to do it in such a way that anybody who's developing any kind of course um, could actually take some of these principles and apply them to the courses that they're either teaching or if you're a learning technologist, if you're wanting to support this in the building of the courses. So we decided to package this and we decided to keep it purposely short. So we've made a two week course and we've done it with the estimation of around about two hours of uh, student effort time or learner effort time. Um, that was done on purpose and we wanted to keep it short. We wanted to keep it sweet. We didn't want to have a course that was going to be you know, too long, uh, was going to put people off. Uh, in the engagement of it, so we wanted to have some sort of snapshots in there, um, and who knows, you know, something like this might might expand a little bit, a little bit further in the future. So looking at some of those key skills that we've talked about at the start, there we tried to use this based on some of the experiences and feedback from from the staff, and um, so some a lot of the academics we've worked with, and um, we tried to take some of that feedback on board and take some of that and along with our own experiences my colleagues included that you know were part of the process in this um, and trying to, to capture that and think well how what is it they're looking for and what is it they're, they're trying to achieve in their courses and trying to collate all that which is quite difficult in its in itself because we had to sort of cherry pick the most important parts of that but it was still a very very valuable uh, exercise in doing and while we were gathering that, we wanted to make sure that the information we were taking on board there, we had to make sure that the skills were sort of transferable. So um, it wouldn't matter uh, if you were teaching engineering, whether you were teaching, uh, you know, uh, sciences or sports, anything like that. We wanted to take all of that information and make sure those skills were transferable across a multitude of platforms, uh, courses, um, length as well. We didn't, you know, we didn't want to have it tied down so the courses could only be so long um, and it had to be a sort of enjoyable experience as well. Now this course as we were building it um, it can be used in a couple of senses here. Now you can either obviously 
uh, apply this when you're taking to build your own courses, which we hope people will do. Um, and this can almost be a sort of form of CPD. So it could be for people who have been teaching in the field for many years um, or people who are new to this. Um, so they can use it as a form of, of CPD. And the, the good thing about it, they can cherry pick what's in the course. They don't necessarily have to do um, every single thing or every single section of the course. Um, they are free to sort of go in and out of the sections that they feel are most valuable to them. Now at the university, um, we use this course as a prerequisite for some of our learning design workshops, which I'll go on to in a little bit just to show you how we pulled this together. Um, but this has been a really valuable exercise because we find that when we go into the learning design workshops, um, a lot of the questions that people ask hopefully will be answered in this course before they actually go on to uh, apply this into their own uh, course materials. So we're just having a quick look at the key topics. So these are the key areas that we, we actually cover in our course. So the first one is talking about understanding your learners. So some of you might be familiar with the term persona. I have an example of persona uh, at the end to show you. But these are what we want to do in the course is to help people understand who the audience is that they're they're pushing the materials out to. So, um, you know, for example, we've taken the, the char characteristics of a typical online learner, looking at what they what they are, what their motivations are, and what the constraints may be, um, and trying to build that into the course as well. We look at the power of active learning and narrative. I think this is one of the key points, certainly, within the course, is, is sort of telling the story. Um, we're not necessarily saying to people, you know, you just upload your materials and just, you know, off you go, uh, let your students uh, go away and learn. We wanted to try and build a story arc. And we, what we've tried to do in this course is to try and show you a little bit about how you do that. Um, and sort of the key thing to look out for uh, within the course and also to have a little think about how your learners are interacting with the course and sometimes having the sort of narrative built within there and um, sort of help take them along that little bit of a journey. We will look a little bit about how to make content engaging. And again, this is, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a tough, it's a tough question to, to answer this one because everybody has their own, own take on that. But what we've got in there, we, we've given you some ideas, hopefully to take away. Uh, we talk a little bit about, you know, making, you know, in, chunking material and making you know information um, available, uh, how you access that content and so on and so forth. So um, we tried to package that quite neatly uh, where we can. And finally, the fourth, the final section of the course is uh, we've called it your digital toolbox, but it's just based around sort of the tools to maybe think about. Um, again, this section, the very final one, as we're all aware, um, there is a multitude of uh, digital tools out there that everybody uses for, for various reasons. Um, we've kind of give you some hints and tips around that and we've talked a little bit uh, a bit about accessibility and, and things to keep in the back of your mind when making those um, choices. So we didn't well we didn't pluck these key topics out of thin air. Uh, we actually based these on previous short online courses that we've done in the past. Um, we found that these these issues um, came up over and over and over again as we're building. So um, it's a little bit of learnt by experience, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but what we've tried to do is we on the previous courses that we have built, um, we've looked at those, and these are, tend to be the reoccurring um, either questions that come up or features that people are looking for in their courses. I've got an example here just to show you what what I mean. So this one here is one of our MicroMaster courses that we've used on edX. I think some of you may be familiar with the MOOC platform. So this is just based around um, data science um, and looking at predictive modeling. So what we've tried to do is uh, we base courses there. Um, it's a fairly short course um, and looking at the sort of eight to 10 hours a week. So we tried to apply some of those principles uh, into this course. Uh, and we've also taken some great ideas from this, so things that we've learned, so, you know, looking at, say, the length of videos or how many interactive elements are were there or how much discussion between the subsequent learners that were in there and trying to apply those into the courses. And we've taken that, we've moved that on. I mean, this course is about a year or so old now, 
and we've tried to apply this to our course. So this is a quick snapshot of um, one of the pages on our course, which uh, we'll hopefully show you at the very end. Um, we've, tried to see, we've tried to break it down into sections here. So uh, you've got your course introduction, and then there's a section about active learning. So we've tried to have a good mix um, of activities based within there. So how did we eventually get to this? So how do we get to the point of actually building the course? What does it look like? What are the constraints? What are the challenges that we come up with? So what we did here is once we had come up with the key topics, uh, we had to begin the planning and design phase. So we had to actually think about, you know, got the key topics in there, how are we going to make this course of interest? How is it going to be applicable? And how are people going to learn something from this? Because that's the whole takeaway. We want people to come away from this uh, better informed than before they came in. So we had to make a decision on the platform. Um, so we had to make uh, a, dis a slight desi d design decision. So we had to look at, you know, is it going to go in a MOOC? Is it going to go in a VLE? Because that would kind of shape how we built the course and how we delivered this to an audience. I don't know if some of you would have recognised from the screenshot, but we decided to go with uh, FutureLearn, and that was purely based around subject specialism on the platform. They do focus a lot on social sciences, um, educational courses, there are other great courses on there uh, about designing or working in blended learning and, and online course development. Uh, but we felt this is probably more suitable than, you know, probably the more science based ones in the likes of edX, um, which I showed you there. So we decided to do an ABC learning design uh, to do to work to, to sort of map out the work that we've done. Uh, I will show you an example of what this looked like. This was really important because this actually highlighted some holes that we came across, so some of the pitfalls. We might have thought, well, this in theory sounded like a good idea, but when we tried to apply it to the learning design workshop, we actually realised mm, maybe this isn't too relevant for this course, uh, or maybe we need to change this activity, or there's not enough of you know, interaction in there, there's too much uh, in the way of video or reading and so on and so forth. Once that side was taken and completely finished, that's when the writing uh, process begins. Now, myself and my colleagues uh, were all uh, instructional designers um, and we had to actually take on the role of the academic, which I can say uh, from this experience is, uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting and challenging all at the same time. Um, so we had to end up doing two roles at once, uh, which was quite unique, um, I must admit. I enjoyed it um, as much as it was challenging, but it was a good process to actually begin uh, thinking about the course on a, on a totally different level. Uh, it made us think a little bit deeper about what we were doing. So just in case for those who are not aware of what ABC Learning Design Workshop is or looks like, it is something that was developed by um, Natasha Perovich and Clive Young um, from UCL um, and it's done in research with, with JISC. And what they've done is they've taken some of those design principles and they've worked using the learning type design cards, which I'll show you in a second, from Diana Lorillard. Uh, I'd highly recommend if you want to find out a bit more about some of the cards and things that I'm showing you in the next slide. Uh, very, very worthwhile having a look. Really done some really interesting papers. Uh, around learning and design and how uh, people learn. So what we did, um, we ended up going a stage further and taking these cards. Now, um, there are six cards in here, all ranging from acquisition all the way through to production. So we had a little look about how we we're going to apply these. So each of these cards actually pertain to something. Um, so you can have a bunch of activities within here um, from like say podcasting to reading to multiple choice quizzes to coding activities uh, you name it you can map it out with these so the whole point of these was to take these cards and map out the course now each of these cards represent a different thing so if we look at the acquisition card that's an example of passive learning so you just want the students to actually go in and read or watch something or listen to a podcast and the rest of them are based around sort of active learning so you've got the rest of them were actually requiring the students to do something. Um, and the whole point of this was to try and make the course as engaging and as interesting and informative as possible. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there was a good mix of these. Now these are the kind of examples that each of the cards relates to. Um, 
Now this list isn't exhaustive, um, these are just some examples that you can use. So as I was saying earlier, the acquisition one, because it's passive, you can see there's some passive activities in there, so they're just reading or watching or listening to something, whereas the rest of them um, requires them to actually do something. So you might look at the production tab there and think they might need to go away and produce a presentation or write a report and submit that, um, and you've got things like discussions in there. Now what I should say, is that the cards aren't coloured there just for my entertainment. Uh, they do have uh, a reasoning for that. Now one of the reasons for making them coloured, apart from making it easier to distinguish which is which, um, is actually when you come to map it out, it actually tells you if you have too much or too little of a said activity. And this is one that we prepared. Now this is just a quick snapshot of one that we did for our course. So as you can see there, it's only a small snapshot, so it looks like there's a lot of blue in there. It looks like I've done a lot of acquisition. But the point of this is to show you right across the board um, how many activities there are in there. So for example, if I were to take this snapshot here um, and say, right, say all of those cards were blue, right away that would send alarm bells thinking actually there's too much of one style of activity in there. There's not enough engagement with other um, activities and you're not allowing the student to participate uh, that much in the course. So this snapshot here just shows you that there's a little bit of a, a flow between that. So there's naturally always going to be a bit more passive learning and there's going to be more blue cards acquisitions in there because you, you're having to tell the story and then getting the students to actually uh, partake in this. But as you can see throughout this we've tried to mix in some little production activities in there. So we've asked the, the, the learners you know, you've read about this, you understand what this principle is now, like, let's go and have an activity, let's try it out ourselves. Uh, and then they can hopefully then apply that to their own uh, courses as they're working through it. So what we had to then do was then we looked at the application of this. Um, and because we went with FutureLearn, every platform has its own restrictions, strengths, weaknesses, whatever you want to call it. Um, and FutureLearn, it's, it's a great tool for storytelling. It's got a really nice flow to it. Those who have used it or you may have studied courses on it before will we'll see it actually look quite nice and it, it flows quite well. But you can obviously do certain activities. For example, if I want to do, to do a course in data science, it's not really very sort of good in terms of applying coding and um, that kind of thing to it. So, the point of this was that we could actually design this on any course. It wouldn't really matter whether it's FutureLearn, uh, Moodle, Blackboard, edX, it wouldn't make a difference. Um, we've just applied it to this course because it works better, but the principles within there can be applied to any course. And this, yeah, as I say, it was looking at the design principle to allow good course design, and that was the key thing. It was to show you how to do good course design. Um, and we didn't want it to be restrictive. Um, I've worked with you know other VLEs in the past using Moodle, using uh, Blackboard now at the university. Uh, they all come with their quirks, um, you know, good points and bad points. Um, but that shouldn't that shouldn't stop you um, from designing a good course. We wanted to also look at making the most of digital tools. So it's trying to justify your choices when you're in your courses. So. Again, we talk a lot about accessibility being one of the ones. We talk about what tools are available to you. So again, coming back to FutureLearn, there was a certain set of tools available to us, but we had to be aware that there were tools that weren't available to us. So how do we work around that? And not only that, how can you apply that? So what, have, what platform are you working on? What are the restrictions within there? And how can you make that work for you? Because it should be about the content, not the actual um, platform or tools that you have available to you. And one of the key things we've always said is to focus on the learner, the student. What is what are their motivations for this? And this comes back to the persona thing that we, we talked a bit about at the start. And we did this before we actually started our course. And we try and do this before every course that we develop. We tend to look and focus at the personas. So there's some work done at the university um, with an external organisation. This is just a screenshot of one of the ones that they pulled together. So this is like a, a sort of demo uh, student caution careerist, not easy to say at this time in the morning, um, but this is a, given an outline for their motivations, you know, why did they want to come and study at the university, um, they may have, you know, a various backgrounds in education, some positive, some negative, so it's all about thinking about that as well when you're developing your course. 
So some of the key points just to sort of take away before we have a quick look at the course itself. We need to have a clear idea of the audience. So when we're looking at this um, course and when we apply this to your own courses, we try to focus on that coming across in our course. So having that clear idea of who the course is aimed at. Second one, and probably in my opinion, and probably one of the more important ones, is be patient. I think whenever you're building courses, um, and this comes from both ends as a learning technologist and a structural designer, or a, whether you're an academic building courses, it does take time. But if you apply these principles, it's worth it. It's like you do the short term pain for, for long term gain. Consider a little bit about the course that you're, you're building um, and think a little bit about the platform. So coming back to that point about what is your, what are your restrictions, what are you trying to deliver um, and how can you apply those irrespective of what the platform might necessarily look like. And finally, just talking a little bit, coming back to that narrative as well. Now, it's not an easy thing to do sometimes when we say tell the story of the, the course content. Like, what, does that, what does that even mean? Um, it's just what we're meaning there, just making sure your content is just taking the, the student to, you know, the flow of the course. Um, so they know what they're expected to do at the start and what the outcome is at the very end. We often find that when we build that kind of flow into the course, um, it does tend to make um, not the course sort of more interesting, so to speak, but it does make the, the student journey that little bit easier. You know, there's a, there's a definite narrative. They understand what the course is getting at. And as they're going through it, they can feel that knowledge building um, and they can just feel a general development um, of the overall course. So what I will quickly do is I will share the course. And um, hopefully you can see that just now. Um, if anybody can, or Kendra, if you can't see that, just let me know. Um, so this front page of our course, um, as I say, starts on the 7th of June. We give you an outline of what's in here. And um, yeah, you can watch the trailer as well. The trailer will give you uh, a little bit of background. I may or may not appear in it, but that's, uh, that's uh, <laughs> for another day. What the course does is um, gives you a sort of overview. So again, it's two weeks long. Um, we split it into sort of two halves. So you've got your understanding, your learners, the act of uh, learning and narrative, and then we go on to a little bit about how to make the content engaging, and you've got a digital toolbox thing at the end. And what I will say in each of the sections here, we have um, some really great podcasts. So we've got experts from the university and from Future Learn that come in uh, and they give their views on some of the questions um, that are in there. Um, if I'll click on to some of this as well, so you can see interesting here, top 10 accessibility checks. These are just some of the things that we go into. Some of the, we've actually leaned on some of the expertise at the university around that. So we have our own um, open educational resources uh, team and they have shared some of their insights with us around stuff like this. And there's some information on the, the course there which talks about what personas are, target audience, why do you want to have personas? What are the benefits of doing this? And we talk a little bit. These are some examples of the active learning. So it's that whole idea about feedback and telling the story, key concepts, and the sort of active versus um, passive um, information that's on the course. So all of this here should be available uh, within here. Um, and as I say, the course starts on Monday. And yes, feel free to sign up. Have a look at it. And uh, as always, we look forward to seeing you on the course. That's any questions? That's brilliant, Marcelo. <laughs> so many questions. So <laughs> many. Maybe questions. I should have cut that bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Well, you can bring us back into the gallery now, and we can have a quick chat. So I, I'm intrigued. Your idea about using personas is yes. is really interesting. So I've used that in as business product development before, where we've we've produced new 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 products in in a commercial environment. It's it's more unusual to see that in an educational setting. So what kind what what was the range of personas you came up with for this course? So this one here, we actually focused around. Um... It's a little bit of a mix, so we tried to focus a little bit around um, 
a more generic approach. So we tended to focus on a, a range of different personas. So we had the cautious careerist, um, we had somebody else who had been away from education for a long time and looking to come back in. We had the um, the person that was, um, you know, just say for example, leaving school and coming straight into education, so we're very fresh in the, the knowledge. So what we're trying to say to people is, um, when you're applying these principles, have a look at have a look at all of these and try and think about what where does your course fit in within these variety variety of personas. So in this certain one, there wasn't a specific one we aimed at. It was more just to say, have a think about these. Why you know, and more importantly, telling them why it's important to think about them because it helps your course and your course development as well. And one follow up from that, then once you created these personas mm -hmm. and put them through the course. Did you find that you had to change anything after taking one persona through the course? Like thinking, well, this kind of learner wouldn't react as well to this particular approach. Or did, did you find you had to change things as you went along? Yeah, there was definitely. I thought about that. We had to look at it because one of the things we were doing is, is it's quite hard when you've got your instructional designer hat. You just think of it. I need to build this. I need to, I need to share this. I need to tell this. And as we were going through it, we actually thought, um, for example, I think on the section on um, making the course um, engagement, how to make your course engaging, we actually felt at some points it was almost too um, too granular. And we felt that we went into almost too much detail about you need to do this, you need to do that. And we thought, well, if somebody comes in that knows a little bit about this, they're instantly going to go, well, this is too obvious you're telling me this is far too obvious so we needed to change it take them off in a different direction um, and change it to make it a little bit more about you know why they need to make it engagement we talked a, a lot about things like OERs um, talked a lot about accessibility so they tried to make it slightly more generic and build it out slightly rather than trying to focus on all the the nitty-gritty parts of of the course that's brilliant. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. So I'm, I'm turning to the room now. Um, do you have any questions uh, for Marcelo? You can unmute yourself and ask yourself if you like. They're all just dying to get in the course, I can tell. <laughs> Walter, you have a question. Yes, uh, Marcelo, it's sometimes when personas are created, they also include a, an image of that fictitious person. Yeah. And so there's always an argument about do you use a real person or do you use the avatar as, as, a, as a means of expressing that person? Uh, well, Is there any standard that you use within your work? Uh, we, we tend to just use sort of generic images. So you saw that one there of the, the cautious Catherine, I think it was, the cautious <laughs> career. Um, we tended to right. use sort of, sort of generic images of the person uh, because the slide after or the section after that, that was just a, a small screenshot, actually goes into like sort of bullet points into, you know, um, who the person is, their background, and how a course would be sort of applicable to them. Um, so it's more it's more generic. Um, there was not, there's, there's no set standard or set, set of rules. And we, we did that with our marketing department. So um, they had much greater input into that part than we did. Mm -hmm. And just one last question: Have you used the UXDL Honeycomb for as a tool for evaluation? No, we haven't actually. That no. uh, what what is that? Is that oh, it it's um a set of seven building blocks. You know, usefulness, um, accessibility, mm -hmm. value. Yeah. So there's a set of seven building blocks, and you can evaluate your learning course against each of those blocks in the honeycomb oh brilliant i'll have a i'll have a look at that though That's quite yeah uxdl i'll put a link up for you perfect thanks very much and time for one more question because i'm going to jump in if no one else does <laughs> <laughs> so well one thing that just occurs to me marcelo you you said you had to constrain the length of the course mm -hmm. um to three hours two yeah. weeks which is you know, you can cover a fair amount of ground in that time, but obviously you would have had to make some decisions about things to leave out yeah. just because you didn't have enough space. So I'm intrigued. What did you leave out? <laughs> um, I think I, I touched a little bit on the sort of um, the learning design element of it. I think that was a big 
part we had to leave out. We, because I, I I could do four or five six week course and just that alone and nothing else, and we just felt that if we had given them something, it it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um, and we didn't want to detract from um. So what we tend to what we tried to do at the university now is to say that right, before you come to a learning design workshop and actually plan out your course, do this course first. So this two week course almost becomes a prerequisite for coming to this um, because there's just so much to pack in there. So we had to take a lot of that side of things out as well. And, and there's, other, there's other things around, we, again, we touched on the OERs and the accessibility stuff. Um, the OER, we've got our own OER team within the university and they supplied us with some great information, there's great links in there and there's some really useful, but again, we could have gone into so much, so, so much there. Uh, so we had to really scale back. So people might think, well, two week course, you know, it can't be that hard to put together. Trust me, it's harder to put together a two week course than it is to put together a six, seven, eight, eight week course. That's absolutely, that, I, I, I remember that about writing you know, essays and dissertations. <laughs> there was always too much stuff yeah. <laughs> and you always had to cut stuff out, but that that's brilliant. Okay, well, that, that just brings us to the end of our 30 minutes. Um, I really appreciate you sharing this, Marcelo, and I'm really yeah. looking forward to the course. Um, and I'm, I'm totally going to judge you on those four <laughs> areas <laughs> that you've outlined. Once I've finished the course, I'm coming back to you. You know, if they don't hold up, I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'm just leaving but, myself open here. <laughs> but it's great. It is great work. And it's great that you've put it out there and shared it with the community. So thanks again, Marcelo. And thanks for joining us here today uh, in this session. We will continue the conversation. Um, but for those of you joining us on YouTube land, please, until our next session, stay safe.